go ahead. Good afternoon or good morning, uh, everybody at the PAWD. Uh, I'm speaking to you from not actually Toronto, as is indicated on the screen, but from Chicago, where I am presently attending the Chicago Midwinter Meeting. It is currently 1 a.m. in the morning, so if uh, I happen to fall asleep as I'm doing the presentation, please wake me up. Today, we're going to be talking about a number of uh, very interesting topics, adhesion, we're going to be talking about comfortable cavity preparation, uh, and a few other areas that are very important in dentistry. My role is that I'm the Educational Director of Warwick eMasters in Aesthetic Dentistry, uh, the co-founder of Aesthetic Dentistry Education Center at the State University of New York in Buffalo. I also write uh, the Products Editor of Dentistry Today, uh, where we test and compare new products, and the International Editor-in-Chief of Dental Tribune. Uh, I'm past president of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, but uh, I make my living in the private clinical practice, and uh, that's why I pay a lot of attention to uh, the efficiency of products, to the efficacy of products, how well they work, and how easy they are to use. You uh, may find uh, my most recent textbook, Contemporary Aesthetic Dentistry, with Elsevier. It's available uh, at the Elsevier website or at Amazon, and uh, it's about 800 pages of many, many aesthetic techniques, uh, how to, beginning to end. Now, uh, I also consult for numerous companies, uh, work with manufacturers, distributors, and trading companies, and any of these relationships could uh, affect what I'm going to tell you, but I do work with many of the companies in the dental field, so hopefully all the uh, prejudices that I have will cancel out. If anybody would like to contact me, you can contact me at ep.rogers.com, the email address that you see at the bottom, and I'll usually be able to get back to you uh, with answers, brief questions, please, brief answers. Uh, I'll try to get back to you within a few days. The learning objectives for today are that we're going to take problems that we have in clinical practice and we try to solve them. We find solutions for them. These solutions have to be uh, better than what we're using now, they have to be faster than what we are using now, and they have to be easier. Otherwise, there's not much point. We're going to differentiate and select adhesives, differentiate and select burrs, and differentiate and select diagnostic tools and techniques. The first area we're going to look at is post-operative sensitivity and how to eliminate it. Today, with the dental materials and dental technologies that we have, we really do not need to have our patients suffer from post-operative sensitivity. But in order to do this, we first have to understand how sensitivity starts. Uh, so how does uh, post-operative sensitivity come about? Well, we have the dentinal tubule. Uh, we're all familiar with that. And this occurs in the dentin, not in the enamel, very important, as we'll see later. And in the uh, dentinal tubule, a vital dentinal tubule, you have an odontoblast at one end. The odontoblast is essentially a nervous process that can uh, feel uh, or sense uh, painful stimuli and stimulate uh, other nerves which will cause a pain sensation in the brain. So in other words, if you stimulate the odontoblast process, you can cause a patient to experience pain. Uh, if uh, this is stimulated, and it's vital, the pain goes directly to the brain, and uh, since the pathway is close, uh, patients really will feel that. We would think that a positive pressure on the uh, dentinal uh, tubular nonoblast process is what's going to cause pain, but in actual fact, this is not the case. Many studies by Brandstrom at the University of Florida have shown that it is, in fact, negative pressure on the nonoblast process which will cause pain not positive process, uh, positive pressures. And here we have the studies that uh, support it, actually just some of the studies. Uh, many uh, studies are available, probably a total of 50 or more. Now, how does this affect us? Well, let's take a look at the dental tubule, which is essentially a closed system. We have the adonoblast process down here. 
we usually have moisture inside the sealed dental tubule, and this dental tubule in the healthy tooth is sealed. There's no change in pressure uh, on the blast process because it's a closed system. And because it's a closed system uh, and there's no change in pressure, there's no sensitivity. So we can be fairly certain that there's not going to be any sensitivity here. But if for some reason the dental tubule is open, this might happen because of bleaching, fracture, uh, decay, wear, a drill, any of a number of uh, situations, this uh, dental tubule is open. When this dental tubule is open, as you see over here, then uh, we can have the escape if there's some sort of stimulus uh, in this area, such as sweet or uh, acidic uh, materials on the surface of the tooth. And when the water moisture is drawn out of the dental tubule, we will actually have an area of negative pressure immediately adjacent to the blast process, causing the pain stimulus to be set. So that is essentially how pain is caused in teeth. And even though our teeth have many, many thousands of dental tubules, all we need is one that is open and has negative pressure on it to uh, result in a sensation of pain for the patient. In most cases, when we have a dental tubule that is open, uh, there's moisture in it, of course, but food debris and bacteria will eventually plug this up. This is called a smear plug. It's basically dirt that uh, occludes the dental tubule. Because it occludes the surface, there's no movement of this moisture. Uh, there's not going to be any sensitivity. So eventually, if you wait long enough, almost every single sensitive dental tubule or sensitive tooth will become insensitive. The problem is that this might take a long time. It take, may take weeks or months. And when the patient wants to have uh, their sensitive tooth treated, you better be able to do it right away. Otherwise, they're going to go to somebody else who will do it for them. Now, let's take a look at fourth and fifth generation dental adhesives. We're going to see what the generations are in a few minutes. But for now, let us say that there are two groups, fourth and fifth generation and sixth and seventh generation. The difference between these two generations is that with fourth and fifth, uh, you use acid edge, and with sixth and seventh, there's no separate edge. So here we have our typical dental tubule, a donoblast process, moisture, smear plug. Why is it a smear plug? Because this tooth is decayed, and that's why uh, it has a smear plug in it. Now we're going to place our acid edge on the surface of this tooth, and the acid edge will dissolve the smear plug. As it dissolves the smear plug, uh, then we can, uh, and changes its nature, consistency, uh, we can then go in with some water, and the water will wash this away, and then we use air to dry it out so we can take a look at it, make sure there's no decay, and it's nice and clean. But we know we have to bond to moist dentin. We can't bond to dry dentin, or at least that's the way we used to think. So we take the uh, dental tubule, which is now cleaned of the smear plug and decay, and we put some moisture back. This has to be an ideal amount of moisture, as you'll see a little bit later on, uh, for this whole procedure to work. And now uh, we will take our bonding agent and place it into the tubule. What you see over here is a depth of about 15 microns. And the instructions for these fourth and fifth generation materials said that first you put the bonding agent in, then without curing it, you put the composite on. Now this composite that you see over here is actually about two millimeters or 2,000 microns thick. The bonding uh, layer over here inside the dental tubule is only about 15 microns thick. So this is a little bit misrepresented. Now, if we put our curing light over here and cure this composite, 2 millimeters or 2,000 microns, as we cure this, this composite will harden more quickly and earlier than the bonding agent. As it hardens, as it polymerizes, it shrinks towards the center. As it shrinks towards the center, it will suck up the still liquid bonding agent inside the dental tubule and 
create an area of negative pressure immediately against the odontoblast, causing pain. So that is why, uh, for many years, when we put in composites, we often created post-operative sensitivity. Now, how can we solve this? Actually, it's very easy. We have our odontoblast, we have it moistened, we take our 15 microns of bonding agent, we put it into the dental arterial, and then we light cure that. When we light cure it, we create a relationship between the bonding agent and the uh, tooth, uh, and this cannot move. So when we put our two millimeters of composite on, and then light cure that, even though the composite shrinks, it can't suck out uh, this bonding agent, which is already polymerized inside the dental tubule, and then there is no post-operative sensitivity. So that's a very good thing over here. If you want to avoid the post-operative sensitivity with fourth and fifth generation, simply let cure your bonding agent and then put your uh, composite on. If you do that, in spite of the instructions, you will have no post-operative sensitivity. What about 6th and 7th uh, generation? 6th and 7th generation materials are a little bit different because there's no separate edge. Now, here we have our dental tubule again, a dental blast process, moisture, and a smear plug. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put our 6th or 7th generation conditioner onto the uh, surface of the tooth. This material is a little bit different. It doesn't dissolve the smear plug, but it infiltrates it. It changes its chemistry, changes its nature. And then, surprisingly, we don't actually wash this denatured or changed smear plug out. We leave it in place. We leave it in place and we like cure it. As we like cure it, uh, it becomes fixed to the sides of the dental tubule and therefore cannot move. Notice that the moisture has not changed in dimension and the relationship of the the uh, abdominal blast process has not changed. There's no negative pressure or positive pressure. We have not altered anything in between these two situations. Then we are uh, ready to put the composite onto this. As we put the composite on and we begin curing it, the uh, composite will shrink towards the center as before, but uh, even though it shrinks towards the center, the bonding agent, which is already fixed inside the tubule, cannot move. And because it cannot move, there's no change in volume for the moisture, and there's no change in pressure, and there's no post-operative sensitivity. So generally, uh, with 6th and 7th generation bonding agents, we simply do not see post-operative sensitivity because the chemistry is different and it treats the dental tubule differently. Now, that is actually a situation uh, where we are dealing with a tooth where uh, we have to prepare and we have to bond and put on a restoration. This is a dentally caused sensitivity or hypersensitivity. And now we see that uh, with fourth and fifth generations, we do not need any sensitivity because we can simply cure the bonding agent before we put the composite on. And with 6th and 7th generation, because of the chemistry, it will not happen. Now, what happens if the patient comes in and they are simply sensitive? They haven't had any uh, work done. Their, their tooth is simply sensitive. And this is because uh, of the super eruption of a tooth, recession, uh, bleaching, any of a number of things which are non uh, uh, non uh, preparatory nature, but still uh, will cause the tooth to be sensitive. What we try to do in a situation like this, and here we see an electron micrograph of the uh, dental tubules, what we try to do is put on a material into the tooth that will create a series of barriers. And uh, very often, materials with oxalic acid will create this a semi-permeable set of barriers which prevent the movement of fluid because if a movement of fluid is prevented, uh, thereby you don't get negative pressure against the odontoblast and no sensitivity, elimination of sensitivity. 
You can see over here where we have the little red bars across, that they're actually horizontal bars in these dental tubules. Those horizontal bars are the oxalic acid bridges which prevent movement of moisture. And here we see uh, inside the dental tubule, uh, this is a false color electron micrograph. This is the surface or the opening of the dental tubule, and here's the depth. And you can see these partial bridges which have formed inside the dental tubules from the oxalic acid uh, treatment uh, to prevent the free movement of moisture and to prevent the movement of moisture away from the adonoblast process. Uh, which causes the negative pressure in that area. Now, let's take a look at fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh generation bonding uh, agents. And we mentioned this before. How are they different? Why are they different? Why do we call them that? Composites require adhesion to the teeth. How much bonding is required? 8 megapascals, 24 megapascals? Is it 15 megapascals or perhaps 35? Which generation do we use? And why? Do we use fourth generation? Do we use fifth generation? Or do we use sixth or seventh? Which is the proper material? And what about moist bonding? Everybody talks about moist bonding, but it's a very hard uh, situation or condition uh, to describe accurately, if at all possible, and hard to create that in the internal cavity in the real life situation. First of all, let's take a look at how much bonding strength is required. We really need about 17 megapascals of uh, adhesion to resist the polymerization contraction of the composite resin. Why do we need to resist the polymerization contraction? We've known this information for a long time. Because if we take a look at this tooth, um, and we have here the enamel and the dentin surface, and we have a bolus of composite resin restorative inside. If there's less than 17 megapascals of adhesion to enamel or to dentin, as the composite is polymerized, it shrinks and uh, will leave a gap between the filling and the tooth, which will cause micro leakage and eventual breakdown of the restoration. So that's not a good thing. On the other hand, if we have more than 17 megapascals of adhesion to both the enamel and the dentin, the shrinkage during the polymerization will be towards the enamel, towards the dentin, and a tight seal will be formed. When a tight seal is formed, uh, it means that we're not going to have any marginal breakdown, we're not going to have any leakage, we're not going to have the uh, restorative breakdown that we saw uh, in the situation before. So we need at least 17 megapascals, preferably a fair bit more. Now, if we take a look at our uh, generations, the first three generations appeared uh, before 1989, uh, and um, they were progressions of uh, better materials. Never mind the entire table, just take a look over here at the dentin bond in megapascals. First generation, you had about 1 to 3 megapascals, which is certainly nothing. Second generation, you had 2 to 8 megapascals, which is somewhat, something, but not a lot. And over here, we see third generation, you had 8 to 15 megapascals. But remember uh, from before that we need at least 70 megapascals to be in a healthy situation. So. Uh, why do we talk about generations? Well, there are many, many hundreds uh, of bonding agents that are available to the dentist. And we can either choose to uh, learn all of these bonding agents, uh, and there are at least 225 bonding agents that have, uh, I've identified, um, so we can learn the properties and the uses and uh, the protocols for each of these 225 different bonding agents, which would be difficult. In fact, it would be probably more than a, a full-time job because you not only have to learn it, you have to learn all the new ones as they're coming out. And there are quite a few new bonding agents coming out every year. Now, Let's take a look at the fourth generation. Fourth generation typically consists of at least three components. There might be more, but there are at least three. We have an edge component, 
and we have two or more bonding components that are used mixed, you have to mix them, share side, or they're used in sequence. So minimum of three components plus the edge. Now let's take a look at fifth generation. We still have an edge, but we have a premixed bond. The premixed bond is often a little bit weaker than the fourth generation, but it is much more predictable because it's been uh, mixed under the exacting conditions of a dental uh, manufacturing facility. Sixth generation does not have a separate edge, but it has two or more components. Because it has two or more components, it's a little bit more technique sensitive than fifth generation, but we have actually cut out the etching step and the etching material. So that's good. But how do we condition the surface? Well, in actual fact, the sixth generation, uh, the there is etch, but the etch is contained within one of the adhesive or bonding components. So you do get etching of the tooth surface, but um, this is not from a separate etch, it's from an included etch. Uh, the downsides of sixth generation are that there are still multiple materials or sequences to be used. Seventh generation has a single component, the etch, the Adhesive, uh, the desensitizer, everything else is in the single component. So in actual fact, this is probably the easiest to do. And now you see that instead of having to worry about 225 different materials or more and learning the properties of each, we've reduced it to four generations. All these generations uh, are uh, fairly similar. So in other words, even though we might have different products from different manufacturers, in, let's say, the fourth generation, all the fourth generation materials essentially behave the same way. Their properties are the same, their protocols are the same, and once you know one, you know all. So it's much easier to remember four generations than over 200 separate materials. Now, here's an interesting study uh, about the number of steps that we have in dental procedures. What we uh, see in this study is the white uh, bar up here is the theoretical bond strength uh, of uh, the adhesive. And here in blue we see the actual bond strength of the adhesive. What's the difference between the adhesives? Here at one side we have a one step. Then we have a two step, a three step, and four step. As you can see over here, the more steps the procedure has in its protocol, the lower the overall bond strength, the actual bond strength, once you use the material. Why is this? Very simply because more steps uh, lead to greater technique sensitivity, fewer steps are less technique sensitive, and uh, it's important to remember the greater, greater efficiency in these procedures, which are done so often every day, will lead to greater productivity in the practice. Now, let us examine the different generations individually. A fourth generation appeared around 1990, 1989-1990, and this involved a total etch, the complete removal of the smear layer with the um, orthophosphoric acid. This process was developed in Japan by uh, professors Fusayama and Nakabayashi and brought to the United States by the late John Gwinnett. Now, these materials bond to enamel very effectively. Remember, the first three generations didn't bond to dentin. Now, we get a good bond to moist dentin. In fact, we got about 17 to 25 megapascals of bond to moist dentin. These materials also bond to metal, to porcelain, and all is good. Here are some examples on the right side. Fortunately, there are a few problems. These are multi-bottle steps, multi-bottle systems, and multi-step systems. Multi-bottle means that it can be confusing, mistakes can be made, uh, and uh, also that incorrect amounts may be used for mixing. All of these materials indicate on their instructions, use equal uh, amounts from bottle A and bottle B before you mix it. Have you ever finished one adhesive component before you finished off the uh, other component? Well, this 
simply means that you were not using the exact equivalent amount of two components. Because there are different viscosities, this can become even more difficult. Uh, Multi-bottle systems are essentially unpredictable because uh, there are so many things that can go wrong in the process. Multi-steps are very inefficient. The more steps that you have with the procedure, the less efficient it is, the less effective it is, the less um, that you're, or the more time that you're going to take doing it, and the less money you will make. Typically, in most jurisdictions around the world, dentists are paid by the procedure, by the filling, not by the time that they spent in the filling. So if you have a multi-step system, which takes up a lot of time, then you're going to be in a situation where uh, your practice is not efficient and uh, you may be losing money because it's taking too long to do anything. Fifth generation came around in 1995. Fifth generation, remember, was um, an etch and a single pre-mixed bottle of adhesive. These materials, and you can see the bond strength of dentin, 20 to 24, well above the uh, 17 megapascals, but uh, not quite as good as the fourth generation. These materials had a single bottle, or have a single bottle. They bond to enamel, they bond to dentin, they bond to metal, they bond to porcelain. Etching is required. That's partly a negative, but not a major one. A moist surface is required. And you see this in all the instructions and all the presentations. A moist surface is required. Well, what is moist? How moist is moist? Uh, and why is that important? Uh, here on the right side, you can see uh, various different uh, fifth generation materials, but there are many, many of these products, so this is just uh, a representative sample. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see about the wet bonding and dry bonding by looking at adhesion inside the dental tubule. And as we look inside the dental tubule over here, you'll see the structure that we were describing before, the irregular walls of the dental tubule. And somewhere down here in a vital situation, there's the odontoblast process. Because this is irregular, it's good to bond to and is likely to retain our restoration. It's much more likely we're going to have better bond strength inside the uh, tubules than at the intertubular surface, which is smoother, flatter, uh, and may not have as many bonding or bondable components. Essentially, uh, when we're doing adhesion, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the resin everywhere inside the dental tubule very quickly, very uh, evenly and very efficiently. Um, and uh, then we can polymerize that resin and create uh, a resin anchor within the dental tubule, which we then measure as adhesion. And the more of these and the more effective they are, uh, the better the adhesion is going to be. Now, another problem occurs if we put in too much water, if we put in too much water, then uh, this is simply uh, not going to work because the water is going to eliminate the uh, resin uh, of uh, or the resin material which should be going inside the dental tubule to act as an anchor for the restoration. And uh, the problem is we really don't know how moist is moist. Nobody really has ever told us that moist is glossy or moist is dripping or moist is any of these things, they simply say moist dentin. And we don't know what it is. And we have to work with a material, we have to work with a situation that we don't really understand. Now let's try to understand this. Here's the dentinal tubule uh, and the uh, peritubular dentin. The intertubular dentin, um, over here, it's all around. The dentinal tubule is inside. The objective is resin filling every tubule in completely. And this resin is polymerized and acts as an anchor for the restoration. If we can cure this, this will be a great result because 
there's not going to be any possibility of sensitivity. There's not going to be any possibility um, uh, of uh, the uh, restoration uh, falling out because it is attached so firmly. Again, we're going to take a look at the three uh, components uh, of dentin and uh, dental tubules, the intertubular dentin as well. Uh, and we'll take a look at the uh, chemical components that we're going to use. Uh, here we have water, blue, resin in red triangles, acetone in black squares, and uh, resin in the acetone solvent over here, which is what we're trying to get to as an intermediate step. The reaction is basically that we have res resin in an acetone solvent, and we add water to it. What happens when these uh, two materials are put together is that the resin separates out, leaving the uh, acetone and the water together. And then the acetone and the water can be volatilized, leaving behind uh, the uh, resin material that is so important for anchoring. So here we go into our uh, ideal dental tubule and the uh, intertubular dentin, and we apply the correct amount of moisture to this uh, preparation. Well, uh, one problem is that we don't know what the what the ideal level of moisture is. We can guess, but we have no idea. Then we're going to apply the adhesive. The adhesive is this resin dissolved in acetone. Remember that because this is uh, an important uh, chemical that we're going to use. So when we apply the adhesive, the adhesive consists of acetone and uh, the uh, resin dissolved in that acetone. The water uh, over here will coat the surface and leaves the resin uh, and acetone together. Acetone is more attracted to water than it is to resin. So it will actually pull away uh, the water molecules from the resin, or the resin will uh, pull away the water molecules uh, from the uh, material. And what will happen is as this is pulled away, the uh, acetone attaches to the water, releasing the resin. The resin is released and uh, leaves the uh, resin inside the tubule and uh, the acetone and the water together. This acetone and the water, as you blow air on the preparation, will tend to rise to the surface. And we now have an acid, uh, sorry, acetone water uh, compound that is at the surface, uh, we volatilize it. As we uh, press the air, the uh, material just simply evaporates from the surface, leaving resin inside the dentinal tubule. Now, when we have a resin, uh, sorry, a dental tubule full of resin, uh, then it's simply a matter of polymerizing it and having the ideal um, situation. But this is assuming that we had the correct amount of moisture in the first place. Now, what happens when our dentin surface is not moist enough? In this case, it's totally dry. The adhesive will enter the uh, tubule unevenly, leaving pockets of air anywhere. As you polymerize it with the curing light, the uh, Acetone and the water are still volatilized, but the resin will not be evenly spaced inside the dental tubule. So the curing will trap air, leaving gaps and reducing the bond strength. Too dry a surface is not good. What happens if the dental surface is too moist? Well, the acetone interacts with some but not all the water molecules. So it'll actually attach to some of the water molecules, the acetone and the water will uh, uh, volatilize, leaving the resin in the middle of the tooth, in the middle of the dental tubule, which is good, uh, except uh, you still have a lot of moisture inside 
uh, the ventral tubule. Uh, the water that's behind will actually act uh, as um, a way for the resin to be pulled out because it's almost a lubricant over here which allows uh, the resin to pull out. Remember that rough surface that you saw of the um, dental tubule? If we fill those rough surfaces with water, as you can see over here, and simply polymerize the resin uh, in the middle, there's not going to be a good attachment. It's not going to be an uneven attachment at the on margins and inside the dental tubule, and eventually this plug of resin will pull away. The water layer contaminates the tooth restorative interface uh, and leads to a failure of the restoration. So now we see how important it is to have just amount, a right amount of moisture inside the dental tubule. Unfortunately, uh, we can't say what the right amount is. And even so, it would be different for every single individual and uh, their uh, oral situation. Now, we're going to take a look at demineralization and resin infiltration in the peritubular uh, dentin. As you can see over here, we're looking at the smear layer. This is the, uh, the debris of the food, the bacteria, and so on in the mouth that uh, is uh, coating many parts of the dentition. And here underneath the smear layer, we see the mineralized dentin. It used to be that um, there was a great uh, onus placed on removing the spare layer a number of years ago, but today it really depends on what you have left before you remove anything so drastically. Now, once we apply the acid etch to the smear layer, the smear layer is removed, and you can see how it's etched away completely, and uh, it goes, uh, the etch goes into the uh, mineralized dentin, getting rid of some of the hydroxy appetite and leaving the collagen fibers that you see over here essentially loose uh, in the uh, tooth surface. This is essentially demineralized dentin. The collagen fibers are simply demineralized dentin. So we now have three uh, areas that we're looking at, mineralized dentin, demineralized dentin, and the smear layer is removed. After the etch has removed the hydroxy appetite, uh, we will then uh, rinse it completely to get rid of all the remaining etch. This is not an absolutely necessary procedure, but it's of course good and part of our regular protocol. Uh, when we see the demineralized dentin uh, and the collagen fibers, uh, which have often become matted because of how much pressure we put upon them. Then once we uh, have all the acid etch rinsed away, we will simply dry this uh, with uh, our air, and very often the collagen fibers collapse. So uh, this collapsed collagen network is not very conducive to good bonding, and remember we have to bond wet as well. So what are we going to do in terms uh, of bonding to the surface? We'll first rehydrate the collapsed collagen network, and after we rehydrated that, same as inside the dental tubule, when there's water, we use the water to attract the acetone of the acetone resin complex. We use the uh, acetone to, or at least the water to attract the acetone into every reach of the tooth. And here uh, we uh, have moistened or wetted. Uh, we've uh, demineralized the uh, dentin. Uh, but it's surrounded by water, not by other fluids. And here below it, you can see the mineralized dentin. The remineralized uh, collagen network is visible here. Then we'll put our adhesive onto uh, this tooth. The adhesive will infiltrate because the adhesive is also drawn by the water. And as it's pulled in by the water, the adhesive will permeate this entire uh, complex very effectively in a matter of seconds. So the resin has now moved in 
in between the collagen fibers to give it a support to be like your this uh, complex. And uh, once uh, we've light cured it, uh, then I just go back for a moment. Once we've light cured it, then we can uh, bond to it. So this is basically the process whereby adhesion works inside the dental dental tubule and around the dental tubule. Generally speaking, with the older adhesives, if these surfaces were wet or moist, but we couldn't divide that, define that wetness or moisture, uh, then we could bond more effectively. If the surfaces had too much water or were too dry, again, not easily definable, uh, then uh, we uh, had problems with the restoration. But we will be offering a solution to moist bonding in just a few minutes. Let's take a look at sixth generation. And sixth generation was introduced in 2000. The advantage of sixth generation uh, include that there's no separate etch step. But unfortunately, uh, the chemistry has gone back to a multi-bottle or multi-step. Uh, system and the bond to enamel is very weak. The bond to dentin is fine. The bond to dentin is 17 to, mega, uh, to 22 megapascals, which is uh, reasonable and easy to work with. These materials also bond to, besides dentin and enamel, to metal and to porcelain. Here on the right, there you see a number of these sixth generation products. And um, then Let's take a look at what some of the problems are with sixth generation and why it's not in as um, wide a use today as it could possibly be. First of all, the multi bottle we discussed before, you never get uh, a system where you mix exactly the right amount of uh, bottle A and bottle B, and thereby you weaken the restoration. So, multiple bottles uh, take time. They're, uh, not efficient and cause problems. Same with multi-step, exactly the same rationale. Uh, just doesn't make sense from uh, that perspective uh, to introduce extra steps um, to slow down your protocol and to uh, make your process longer and less efficient. But what's most important about sixth generation bonding agents was that studies early on, about 2003-2004, were mentioning that the bond to the enamel is weak. The bond to the dentin is perfectly respectable, but the bond to enamel was weak. And some of the, uh, these uh, situations occurred where the enamel was uh, not uh, prepared and uh, not roughed up. If you rough up the enamel, in effect, it becomes healthy enamel. You don't have to worry as much about um, sixth generation debonding at the enamel interface. But the problem is that uh, these uh, sixth generations have been shown uh, conclusively to not be strong on an unprepared enamel surface. They bond well to the dentin, but not to the unprepared enamel surface. So that alone is uh, probably a good reason uh, that this uh, sixth generation restorative should be overlooked and why it hasn't been popular uh, or as popular as it might have been. Seventh generation was introduced in 2002, shortly after sixth generation. The difference between sixth generation and seventh generation is that seventh generation is in a single bottle. Everything is in a single bottle. Uh, the adhesive, the desensitizer, the primer, uh, the bonding material, everything. It's in a single bottle, there's no mixing, so there's no chance of making a mistake. Some of the earlier materials in uh, the seventh generation were the I bond around 2002, uh, and Tri S bond has been around for years, and Go and Beauty bond. So all these materials have been around for quite a while. These materials bond to enamel very effectively. Why is it that they bond more effectively than a sixth generation would? Well, the answer is very simple. Because when you place a seventh uh, generation or sixth generation on a tooth surface, they immediately etch uh, that surface. Uh, and 
uh, the these materials uh, create the etching that the adhesive portion or component can bond to. If the etch is not sufficient, the uh, bond uh, and the entire restoration are at risk. So uh, the bond to enamel with sixth generation is generated by a material that's at a pH of about 2.0, quite acidic. But the uh, active ingredient for seventh generation is typically a pH of 1.0, which means it's 10 times more um, of an etchant, 10 times more likely to on the enamel than a sixth generation product. So the a bond to enamel uh, is 22, uh, 30 pegapascals or more, as is the dentin. Dentin and enamel are very similar. That's very important. Uh, and these materials uh, will uh, work on almost anything. They include bonding to porcelain and to metal in different formats. The most important factor or advantage of seventh generation, though, is that they are moisture independent. How can they be moisture independent? How can you not have wet bonding? Well, in actual fact, uh, you don't need the wet bonding uh, because the seventh generation adhesive creates its own moisture. If you think back to your chemical reactions when you were in high school, uh, you'll remember that when you mix an acid and a base together, you get a salt and, a, and water. So you generate the water through the reaction. With seventh generation adhesives, you have an organic uh, base and you're applying the etch, which is in the uh, seventh generation uh, material, and these two react with each other. They neutralize each other. The result of this uh, chemical process is that you have two components. You have an organic salt and you have moisture. So seventh generation, you don't have to worry about wet or dry. It's moisture independent. And these materials will uh, actually you be useful dry or wet. Nobody really knows what moist or wet is, but everybody can give me a good definition of dry. So that's a major advantage of seventh generation materials, and there's no technique sensitivity. Since there's only one bottle, you can't make very many mistakes. If you can't make any mistakes, you're not likely to. One of the materials that we use uh, most extensively is Beauty Bond, an adhesive material from Shofu. Uh, this material has uh, high bond strength. It's a single component adhesive, self-etching. Releases fluoride and it's light cured. It's got a five micron film thickness, and the film thickness, or the film between the, uh, or uh, sorry, the uh, adhesive layer between the tooth and the restorative material, is typically the weakest component in the whole system. So the more we can minimize the thickness of the bonding agent, the stronger the overall restoration is going to be. In this case, it's a five micron film thickness. It applies and polymerizes clear, so you don't have to worry about the aesthetics. And the advantages of beauty bond are that it's nanofilled, and that no moisture uh, occurs at the restorative surface, and most importantly, it works on moist or dry surfaces. Beauty bond benefits uh, include that it has very high tear strength. There are dual teeth of monomers. The phosphonic acid is uh, developed to uh, target the enamel. The carboxylic acid has been uh, chosen to um, treat the dentin. This is a single component adhesive, which is self-etching, single coat and uh, it's like cured. Um, the beauty bond advantages uh, are that, uh, again, that there's no moisture at the inter uh, restorative interface. If you take a look at this, uh, these electron micrographs over here, uh, you can see uh, the thickness of the uh, 
beauty bond and the thickness of other dimensional uh, bonding agents from other companies. So you can see um, that the film thickness is about half as great with the beauty bond as it is with most other materials. Now let's take a look at the comfortable cavity prep. Now that we understand that the um, cost for sensitivity, we'll be uh, able to apply some of this knowledge to our preparation technologies, what we should use and how we should use it. When I first started dentistry, a couple of decades ago, um, almost every time I worked on a patient, almost every restoration involved anesthesia either a block or a local infiltration that involved anesthesia to make sure the patient wouldn't feel anything. The unfortunate fact is that many of our patients dislike needles in their mouth. In fact, this is their biggest problem with dental treatment. They don't like having the needle in their mouth. If you think back to when you were, before uh, you became a dentist, a patient, and the dentist was coming at your mouth with this long needle. Doesn't make any sense. We're looking to attract new patients who believe in our uh, ability to create comfortable treatment, and we need to uh, have the tools to create the comfortable cavity preparation. First ca question occurs um, at a very basic level. What is the cave? Um, and uh, the, the cave, of course, it's the dark part of the tooth, it's the broken part of the tooth, it's the uh, part that can be scooped away with a spoon. However, how much of the dentin is actually salvageable? How much of the soft dentin, if treated properly, proactively, can become um, part of your uh, tooth once it's healed? So we have to redefine the K, and we'll see that in a few moments. How do we make our diagnosis? And we may or may not have a chance to take a look at diagnostics for uh, the K. How accurate is the diagnostic uh, procedure? In other words, not so much um, whether we get it right, but whether we can repeatedly get it right over a period of time or over a period of uh, individuals who are using the material. What causes pain in the tooth? Well, we already looked at what caused the pain and which instruments to use where and why. Think of uh, a comfortable cavity prep that doesn't involve pain, that doesn't involve um, any injections. How likely is that kind of preparation going to make uh, your patient happier than they otherwise would be? And if they're happier, they're more willing to spend the time and the money in your practice to get their uh, procedures taken care of. And once their procedures are taken care of, um, then they can refer other patients to your practice. So the impact on patients is very important. If they're going to be comfortable, they'll talk about it. If they're very uncomfortable, they'll talk about it. In the middle, if they're just sort of not really comfortable but uncomfortable, they're not likely to talk about it. When patients talk about you and your practice, um, that's when you get the referrals. And it's a major, major impact. Uh, uh, most practices are built on new patients. And if you keep those new patients coming, you will then uh, have uh, the ability to keep your practice busy in the long run. The question is, what is the K? Well, here we're looking uh, at a radiograph uh, of a tooth, and uh, it would seem, this is an extracted tooth, of course, set in a piece of stone, but it would seem that there's a little pit on the occlusal surface, and uh, this is not a major problem with the tooth. But when we slice this tooth uh, open, uh, what we notice is a very different situation. What we notice is that this tooth uh, is actually quite decayed. Uh, there's quite a bit uh, of decay going uh, beyond the uh, dentonal enamel or uh, interface, uh, and it should have showed up in the x-ray. But the problem with the radiograph is that there's so 
much too structured to go to uh, or to go through that often you cannot easily see this kind of decay even when it's present. So how do we make this diagnostic and what do we treat it with? Well, the area over here that's sort of uh, darker is definitely decayed, broken down, and probably not much can be done to salvage it. But on the other hand, the areas that are around it may be proactively treated uh, with fluoride-releasing agents to try to bring them back to normal. Now, here's uh, a tooth that we're looking at. Things are not always as they seem. Here's the way this tooth looks when it is sectioned. So what looked like a very innocent, minimal uh, pit area has actually developed into a large, deep, and extensive um, cavity, which is threatening the floor um, of the uh, preparation, which is also the roof of the um, of the pulp chamber. So you have to be very careful how you deal with this over here. If you take a spoon and you scoop the decay out, this entire decay will come out, but also some of the questionable uh, affected dentin over here. And if you use a spoon, you're very likely to see an exposure very quickly. The first thing we do is we open this uh, tooth up with a burr called a fissurotomy burr from SS White. This is a very thin, very hard burr that's designed for uh, minimally invasive uh, tooth preparation, uh, placement um, of sealants and other areas where uh, you want to be as conservative as possible. Now, the development of birds over the years have included the development of metal, uh, stainless steel, has gone to diamonds, and from diamonds to carbides. This is the one we use now, the Great White 1557, one of our favorite birds. Uh, what do these instruments do at the level of the dentin? They put this into the K on the tooth, and there may be some vital uh, material there, and there may be no vital material there. What happens and what causes pain? Well, let's compare carbides and diamonds. When you have uh, this kind of situation where you have some tubules that are open and some tubules that are closed, every time you apply the drill, you're opening up a lot more tubules. When metal burrs meet dented, the donoblast uh, is hopefully non vital and not likely to lead to pain. If the dental tubule is not opened, then there will not be any pain. So we can try to avoid uh, that. If, on the other hand, the dental tube with vital component, uh, a donoblast, is opened, then we will feel the sensitivity and it will be pain. Over here, we can see uh, the burr creating the uh, final surface of the decay, uh, of the cavity, uh, before restoration. And we can see over here that when we apply this burr to the dentin, we can often create um, discomfort in the patient. Metal and diamond burrs cut the cave dentin and healthy dentin indiscriminately. So the cave dentin and healthy dentin are both removed. There's no proprioception because there isn't a major, uh, or there's a very major difference in thickness between the burr and the tooth structure. So beyond, or to add to the development of these instruments over the years, we've now added the Smart Burr 2. Smart Burr 2 is a polymer instrument. It's a polymer instrument uh, that is harder than decay and over here, um, once uh, it hits solid 2 structure, it will basically be stopped and cannot remove uh, 
any more tooth. Not only will it not remove any tooth, but uh, since it's softer than healthy dentin, if we touch healthy dentin with a smart burr, it will actually wear away the burr. So you can see over here that it's softer than healthy dentin, wearing away the uh, smart burr, but it's harder than uh, decay dentin. It's also softer than secondary dentin. So here we're going to take a look diagrammatically. Enamel is about 360 to 430 in uh, nuke hardness. Healthy dentin is 70 to 90. And uh, effective dentin uh, is 0 to 30 uh, in nuke hardness. Now, it's important to see the hardness of healthy uh, dentin compared to infected dentin. Infected dentin is 0 to 30. Healthy uh, is 70 to 90. So it's a major, major difference. Now, we have uh, over here a table that shows the various hardnesses. Um, and we'll see how we can uh, separate out what we're doing. Infected dentin is towards the left side of this, from 0 to 30. Healthy dentin is 70 to 90. In between, there's a hardness of about 50. The SmartBird 2 instrument is designed to have a hardness of about 50 knook, which means it will cut the infected dentin, but it also means it will not cut healthy dentin. It cannot. It's too soft. This is a major advantage. As you can see, we're going into this uh, extracted tooth, but the one that has decay uh, going fairly deeply. Some of this is infected dentin, which we want to remove. Some of it may be affected or affected dentin, which can come back to health if treated properly. We apply the smart bird gently with a very slow rotation, as you can see over here. And, uh, it's very important that you have slow rotation, uh, nothing more than 100 to 200 RPMs, revolutions per minute. And here you can see more and more of the decay being removed. Finally, all the decay is gone. And uh, then we can uh, see uh, what is left. When we apply the smart burr, uh, once we reach healthy or secondary dentin, the smart burr will wear itself away, not the tooth, which means that without knowing exactly what's going on inside the tooth, we can treat it and get great results because the smart burr actually makes smart decisions. Here you see uh, one small cavity that we want to do without any anesthetic. But today, we do 70, about 75 percent of all our restorative work without any anesthetic. Here you see a broken down mesial on a first molar uh, with some decay, and we go in with the fish phlegotomy to just clean it out. And once we've gone in with the fish phlegotomy to clean it out, we go in with the smart burr to uh, to get rid of the remaining decay. Once all the tooth structure is healthy, then we simply restore it. Comfortable cavity preparation consists of carbides, uh, the great white carbides. It consists of the fish rotting system and the smart bird too. And very often, we can eliminate that process that so many patients don't like, that of injections. It leads to more patient satisfaction. The comfortable cavity prep from SS White improves, uh, builds patient confidence and improves visibility because people will refer to practice. The comfortable cavity prep also complements marketing because you can certainly talk about no anesthetic and people will want to listen. Now because people's confidence is increased, you'll get more referrals and uh, overall it'll grow in practice. Now, when we have this, we uh, can not only grow practice, but growing the practice enhances the dentist income. It also creates 
that's satisfaction and leads to practice success, which is uh, what we would like to have. So I think that brings us to the end of our dental adhesion and desensitization uh, and uh, preparation with burrs section. And um, we will now uh, switch off. Nico, if you can take over again.